Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, this is Anna from UNM, and I am going to welcome you all to our second session of the IDGE Symposium Series. And uh, this is the series that is occurring the odd weeks of the spring term here. On, we will have another one coming up on April 6th and then on April 20th. The one on April 6th will be covering GPCRs and the one on April 20th will be highlighting uh, work on ion channels. And just to give you guys a lay of the land for these sessions, we have uh, two speakers and we will uh, let those two speakers give their presentations. And in the meantime of them giving the presentation, we encourage you to write in questions or comments into the um, Q&A um, bu button that you should be seeing on the bottom there. And then uh, after both speakers have given their presentation, we will have a Q&A session and uh, answer and discuss those uh, various topics and questions that came up during the talks. So on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Gary, who can then introduce Martin. I'm Gary Johnson. I'm going to give a very brief introduction for Martin because I want to save our time for the science. Uh, Martin is on the faculty at in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, I would just say he published a paper a couple of months ago in Cell Systems that I think everyone can learn something from. I thought it was a great paper and I think he's going to um, spin off on from that paper and the work he's currently doing on um, targeting phenotypic transitions. And I will try to add to that in my presentation and we thought we would go right back to back and then have questions together. So Martin, you're up. That sounds great. Thanks, Gary, for the introduction. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, here uh, to give me the opportunity to present our research here today uh, the, to the IG and Gary. And I uh, hope you're all doing well in this crisis, corona crisis. So um, our lab is um, interested in cancer metastasis and therapy resistance, and we kind of merge MS-based proteomics, chemical biology, and pharmacology approaches to identify novel targets to overcome these issues in this disease. So I'll just give you a very quick refresher on cancer metastasis, which is the primary cause of cancer-related mortality. So uh, in order for cancer cells to metastasize, that is to spread across the body, they need to escape the primary tumor. And in order to do so, they need to undergo phenotypic transitions, famously so the epithelial mesenchymal transition, but also other transitions that are highly related to the EMT. And by doing so, they will become motile. They are able to degrade extracellular matrix and move out into blood and lymph vessels, travel to distant sites to other organs and form uh, micrometastases that can go dormant or activate rebound growth to form macrometastases. Now, these phenotypic transitions also contribute to tumor heterogeneity in the uh, primary tumor, the primary site. Uh, so there are cancer cells present in various differentiation states. And to make matters worse, these programs that become activated uh, during these uh, transitions, they also increase apoptosis resistance and drug resistance of these cells. So it is believed that they are left behind after therapies end and they lead to uh, disease relapse. So for all these reasons, we require novel drugs that can block or reverse these transitions to, in order to block metastasis and overcome therapy resistance. So in order to find novel drug targets that cause these or that activate these processes, we first need to look at the tumor itself and the signaling pathways that are active in the tumor. So as I already mentioned, tumors are highly heterogeneous uh, entities. There are uh, cells present, in, cancer cells present in various different changing states and metabolic states. There are infiltrating um, stromal cells such as uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, tumor-associated macrophages, lymphocytes, and so on. And all these cells communicate with each other through soluble factors that they release into the tumor microenvironment, but also through cell cell contacts. And these signals uh, trigger intracellular uh, processes that cause these transitions. So in order to identify novel drug targets, um, to block metastasis and overcome therapy resistance, we need to analyze these signaling pathways. 
And just by looking at some of these ligands, you already see many of these pathways are um, regulated by protein kinases, uh, receptor kinases, intracellular kinases. So uh, we have a strong focus on looking at these kinases um, to identify novel targets. And um, our system to study these processes, tumor heterogeneity and these lymphatic transitions, we look at hepatocellular carcinoma. This is the model we studied over the last five years. And uh, HCC is really the fifth most common cancer worldwide and the second most deadly with an 18% uh, five-year survival rate. So um, this is a very interesting system for us to look at. It is extremely drug resistant, not only because it has uh, almost no uh, druggable driver mutations, but also because it has this high intrinsic resistance to chemotherapy and target therapy. Nonetheless, there are now some target therapies available um, that all started in 2007 with sorafenib, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor. Then later in 2017 and onwards, more kinase inhibitors came um, out that um, show efficacy in the clinic against HCC. And then here, 2019, 2020, just very recently, immune checkpoint inhibitors entered the stage uh, either alone or in combination. And here, 2020, this is the new first line treatment here for HCC, that is a tezolizumab plus bevacizumab, uh, which achieves an objective response rate of about 30%, which um, for HCC is revolutionary. Uh, overall, though still yeah, unsatisfying, as you can imagine. So uh, going through the literature, there is some evidence that the EMT promotes this high intrinsic therapy resistance of HCC, um, actually also adaptive therapy resistance, as uh, shown here by the uh, kinase inhibitor cabozantinib, which targets two uh, very prominent EMT kinases, that is the CMET and AXL, which is, and cabozantinib is the second line to sorafenib when patients progress. So there is evidence that um, this EMT is driven by kinases in HCC. However, like there is no um, uh, like unifying picture of these pathways that drive uh, drug resistance in EMT here. So in order to find out uh, which kinases drive these pathways, we use a chemical proteomics tool that is the Kino beads or multiplex inhibitor beads. And you heard about those uh, from Gary before. So uh, I'll just kind of um, uh, give you a refresher. So Kino beads are sephiros beads that carry immobilized uh, non-selective kinase inhibitors that bind many, many kinases with nanomolar affinity. And we can use those to enrich most expressed kinases from cell and tissue lysates for LCMS analysis. And this process is extremely efficient. We estimate that we enrich about 80% of the expressed kinome. We can uh, quantify 200 to sometimes up to 300 kinases, depending on the system, in single LCMS runs. And because this is so efficient, we can use Kinobeat LCMS for differential expression analysis, for example. We can include um, phosphopeptide enrichment steps to also look at kinase phosphorylation states, which uh, gives us a lot of information about their activity. And uh, like very recently, we came up with a competition binding assay that now also allows us to quantify kinase signaling complexes that co-precipitate with those beads. And that gives us additional information about pathway activity and pathway connectivity in the systems we study. Overall, uh, kino beads are a very powerful method uh, for unbiased and multiplex analysis of kinome activity. And uh, we then used this method um, uh, to study HCC. We designed a pharmacoproteomics study to identify the kinase pathways that drive drug resistance in HCC. We started out um, with 17 diverse HCC cell lines. Then in the first experiment, I used the Kino beads to get this comprehensive picture of kinome activity, quantifying about 14,000 proteomics features. In a parallel experiment, we did a high throughput screen, um, testing 299 kinase inhibitors, um, measuring growth inhibition, and then we integrated these two data sets by correlating MS intensities of all the 14,000 proteomics features with the area under those response curve values of the 299 kinase inhibitors we tested. And as a result, we, received, uh, we got ranked lists of proteomics features that correlate either with sensitivity here in red or with resistance to all of these drugs. And 
Finally, we apply gene set enrichment analysis to identify the kinase pathways that are enriched in uh, the tops and the bottoms of these ranked lists. So by doing so, we created a fairly sizable data set of 275 reactome-derived cancer pathways associated with the responses to these drugs. So these uh, resemble basically pathway-based drug response signatures. And uh, we also, by mining this data set, we found that, in fact, EMT-related pathways correlate with resistance to two-thirds of all tested target drugs. So that means EMT really has this very broad impact on resistance to target uh, therapy here in HCC. So this was a very interesting to, uh, to see. Um, following this analysis, we had um, two questions that arose. The first one was, of course, can we do this a similar analysis in HCC patient two more samples? And second, can we use our data set to identify kinases that uh, control the EMT of equilibrium in these cells and potentially identify novel targets? So first off, off, I want to talk about patient samples. So to uh, kind of test that, we collaborated with Raymond Young from uh, UW Surgery, and um, we analyzed paired samples, HCC and normal livers, using our approach. And that worked as well as profiling um, cancer cell lines. We got equal coverage, both on exp uh, kinase expression and phospho level, and uh, coverage of kinase complexes. So that worked quite well. Uh, we got enough data to do the gene set enrichment analysis and um, identify pathways that are operated in two mores. So then to kind of see if these pathways operated in two mores correlate with my um, drug response signatures, drug response pathways I defined in, uh, in vitro in the cell line panel, I then correlated pathway enrichment scores. And what you see here, for example, I just pulled out a few examples out of the 300 drugs. You see, for example, that uh, case number four enriches pathway signatures that uh, seem to indicate sensitivity to the clinical HCC inhibitors, especially here, uh, sorfenib, regorfenib, and then vapenib. So it may suggest that this patient would have benefited from treatment with these drugs. However, the other case is not really actually the difference. It looks more like um, resistant signatures are enriched. So going down the list, however, we find other drugs such as dinaciclip, which is the CDK inhibitor, and oral kinase inhibitors that also seem to enrich sensitivity signatures in these tumors. So it's um, uh, very intriguing to like uh, kind of guess that these patients may have benefited from other inhibitors. And you could um, you could basically test that using these keto beads, uh, identifying these signatures. So overall, um, you see that um, keto beads or could be a very powerful tool for clinical diagnostics, enabling precision oncology, for example, by analyzing core needle biopsies and um, quantifying kinome activities in these uh, samples. So um, now to the second question, can we uh, quantify that portion of the kinome that actually drives the EMT find, uh, to find novel targets? And um, the data suggested that there are, that there are mesenchymal cells present in my uh, cell line panel that I used to um, create this data set. However, we did not know how many. Um, in order to find that out, I clustered the original cell line panel by the expression of 50 well-established uh, EMT marker mRNAs. And indeed, um, the panel cleanly splits into two superclusters, one with a clearly more epithelial expression signature and one with a clearly more mesenchymal expression signature. So that shows again that the EMT seems to dominate the phenotypes that we see in these cell lines. And um, now having this clear distinction, I apply t-test statistics to quantify the kinases that are differentially expressed between these two superclusters. And the result you see here, um, for example, on the expression level, here you see kinase, kinases overlaid with the human kinome dendrogram. In orange, you see the ones which are enriched in mesenchymal cells, and the blue ones are enriched in epithelial cells. And we find that 95 kinases are differentially expressed between the two states. And if we expand that to phosphorylation, we see that even more kinases are differentially phosphorylated between the, those two. And an additional 97 kinases differ significantly in their complex composition between these two EMT states. So we got a wealth of information, which is also orthogonal. Uh, if you uh, look at the Venn diagram here, we see that certain kinases are regulated exclusively uh, either by expression changes in expression, phosphorylation, or complex composition. 
uh, the most striking result obviously is that um, this data reveals that the majority of kinases is impacted by MT state. That means the MT nearly completely rewires the kinome to uh, yeah, regulate almost every pathway in these cells to adapt to the new phenotype. So this gives us like a, a large number of potential clues to follow up on to find kinase that drive uh, the EMT and HCC cells. Uh, I just want to go a bit in more detail here. This is kinase expression again. And we see right away among these kinases are several known proto-oncogenes that uh, can drive the EMT, uh, most importantly AXL, uh, which is also a clinical target in HCC actually already. Um, we also find, surprisingly, several known tumor suppressor kinases and additionally uh, many more kinases which are very poorly studied. So what these do in mesenchymal HCC cells is largely unknown. So we wanted to do, dig deeper into that, uh, kind of validate some of these kinases, kind of study what they do in these cells. And we started out uh, by doing some very systematic studies, establishing a pipeline um, to, to screen the function of these kinases. We do first shRNA knockdowns or CRISPR-Cas knockouts in three different mesenchymal HCC cells which is then followed by unbiased proteome and phosphoproteome profiling to identify the pathways that are associated um, with these kinases. And uh, we also then do EMT marker quantification like uh, with qPCR and Veston uh, to check the EMT state. We do phenotypic screening for drug synergy, for example, uh, but also migration invasion assays. We get like really a, 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 like a very comprehensive picture of what these kinases may do here. And um, in our study here in the cell systems, we started out knocking down AXL and NUOC1 and 2. So AXL is the known driver. You could see it as a positive control. NUOC1 and 2 are much less well studied. NUOC2 is an understudied kinase that they regulate apoptosis resistance and starvation resistance in uh, different cell types. So this might be very interesting for drug resistance. And uh, by knocking them down and profiling them with proteomics, we find that, for example, here the wild types over knockdowns enrich signatures uh, that resemble VEGF signaling, which is receptor tyrosine kinase signaling that controls endothelial cell differentiation, migration, development. So this may be um, um, related to the EMT, but also efferent signaling, which can control um, uh, cell migration. Um, on the level of EMT markers, we find decreased expression of, for example, phospho-ERK and vimentin increased expression of epithelial caterin, which points towards changes in EMT state, and uh, quantify, uh, quantification of qPCR, uh, of um, mRNA markers by qPCR, then also shows widespread changes in EMT markers and EMT state. And that was confirmed by doing uh, kinetic wound healing assays. We see that kinase knockdown, both AXL and NUAC, which show a very similar phenotype in our experiments, both reduce um, cell motility and we find, so, so we find that both AXL and NUOC1 and 2 knockdown in these HCC cells cause EMT reversal, that is mesenchymal to epithelial transition, MET. So the next question we asked was, can we um, exploit um, this EMT reversal to sensitize these drugs towards certain um, kinase inhibitors and to find which drug could be more effective in these cells? We again looked at our proteomics data and we found, for example, that in these knockdown cells, cell cycle checkpoint signaling is enriched as well as TP53, <coughs> excuse me, TP53 regulation of DNA repair genes, which points uh, towards activated cell cycle and replication stress. And that could be confirmed, for example, by looking at single activating features that we quantified by MS, for example, activating sites on CDK1 and 2, as well as for up regulation of their substrates and regulatory subunits. Um, so this uh, confirms that the cell cycle becomes more activated. And what we also see is, for example, activation of DNA damage response signaling here. Check one and two are upregulated and active. Their uh, substrates are, uh, show increased phosphorylation. So that confirms that these cells uh, divide, grow rapidly. They might suffer from replication stress. So can we exploit that? to, for example, sensitize these cells to CDK and checkpoint kinase inhibition. So uh, the model is the following, just to uh, like uh, highlight that a bit more. So we start out with these mesenchymal-like cells which are, which are slow growing. They resemble dormant cells 
uh, they are drug resistant, we can inhibit these kinases. They will undergo MET, upregulate cell cycle and checkpoint uh, kinases, and uh, we may then be able to kill off these cells very efficiently using, for example, dinacyclic, the CDK inhibitor, or ACD7762, the check inhibitor. And um, that is indeed the ca case. Testing these drugs in my knockdown lines, I find, for example, with ACD7762, up to five fold reduction EC50s over scramble control. So there is indeed like a, a substantial drop in EC50s. Um, that kind of uh, pointed out that there could be a combination strategy combining two inhibitors, one targeting an EMT kinase and one uh, targeting an epithelial kinase to efficiently kill these cells. And that also, uh, I could confirm that too. Here is the combination treatment of ACD7762 and the selective NUAC 1 and 2 inhibitor, WZ4003. And indeed, this combination uh, showed like a threefold drop in ac 50 years. Um, so that kind of confirms that we can use this uh, proteomics data, this pharmacoproteomics data to rational design drug combinations that uh, are more eff have higher efficacy in um, these uh, very difficult to kill uh, mesenchymal HCC cells. So this is very exciting. And as you saw, there is much uh, more data. We have to work through many more needs. I will just uh, go maybe, I think I have a little bit of time left, maybe a few minutes into another example. For example, here again is kinase expression that is a differential between EMT states. And we see here the understudied kinases we are working on. And the one which is most progressed is uh, CAM kinase 1D right now. So we uh, not, so this kinase is activated by calcium calmodulin and uh, CAM kinase kinase 1. And it was found previously to be amplified in breast cancer. And uh, researchers showed that it kind of promotes proliferation and some EMT markers. And very recently, it has been shown to mediate resistance to immune therapy by inhibiting fast receptor signaling and CAS phases directly. And as such, CAM kinase 1D might actually have overlapping roles with NUAC 1 and 2 in these cells, because that, that's what we found for NUAC 1 and 2. So this is very exciting. Uh, we find this kinase highly expressed in mesenchymal HCC cells. It is phospho-activated, and we knock the kinase down in three cell lines, our focus model, SMU449, SMU761, achieving a knockdown between six and tenfold. And we did phospho-profiling, which already um, gave us some hints of what it could do. There were several reactome pathways highly enriched. Uh, first and foremost, signaling by road GDPases, which could point towards a role in cell migration. Um, then RNA splicing, which uh, points towards active transcription and maybe cell cycle, protein simulation, but also here, for example, PIP3 activates AKT, which could have something to do with survival. Um, so this is pretty coarse. We then, um, I then look um, into the Phosphocyte Plus database to find out something about kinase substrate relationships and certain functional sites that, yield additional, that may yield additional clues. For example, here um, are all the known substrates. And if I sum that up, I find that CAM kinase 1D seems to positively regulate AKT, mTOR, AMPK, and P21 activated kinase packs and negatively regulate CDK1 and 2 and MAP kinase 1 and 2, that is mitogenic signaling and the cell cycle. And looking at a certain functional sites kind of confirms that. For example, you see strong down regulation of inhibitor, inhibitory sites on CDK1 with knockdown. You see inactivation of apoptosis um, genes. You see activation of PAC that goes down CD44 to the cell migration and uh, upregulation of the cell cycle. So um, I think this is very exciting. And um, our collaborator from the University of Manchester sent us a, a selective inhibitor uh, for this kinase. And we are very excited to test if uh, we see any phenotype that can uh, mimic what we see with the knockdown. And also right now we're doing the drug screen. It's going to be very exciting to see how uh, this kinase turns out. So with that, I want to close the discussion with this short outlook. And I want to thank my lab mates and collaborators, especially Ula Pharmacology, Sean Ong, my postdoc mentor, and Tan May and Andrea, uh, which worked with me on this project. Um, also, of course, Raymond Young, UW Surgery, and Dusty Molly from Chemistry. Also from the Fred Hutch Toran, which helped out with some of the experiments. And then from UNC, Tim Wilson, who uh, is helping us out with a selective SDK17B inhibitor we are also looking at. And of course, Sam Butterworth from the University of Manchester. Uh, we're working on together on the Camp Kinase 1D project.
So thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, I think questions are later after Gary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Um, we will uh, hand it over now to Gary Johnson, who uh, leads the uh, IDD DRGC Kinase Group, which is uh, focusing on highlighting the kinase, the understudy kinases. And he will be talking about the plasticity of the human kinome responding to the targeted kinase inhibi inhibition. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I had a chat message that people couldn't hear me. I put a headset on. Can you? Can people hear me now better? I think people are hearing you, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna follow up on what Martin just talked about. And um, as part of the illuminating the druggable genome with the kinase project, you have to look at the kinome as a whole as well as individual kinases. And, uh, sorry. Um, there are approximately 520 protein kinases, and if you don't count the metabolic kinases. And in the Illuminating the Druggable Genome Project, there are approximately 370 kinases shown here on the left uh, in, the, in the kinome tree that are characterized as being illuminated. And there are about 150 kinases that are poorly characterized and are considered understudied or dark. And except for the tyrosine kinases and to some degree the tyrosine kinase, the tyrosine-like kinases, uh, the understudied kinases are found in every subfamily uh, in the kinome tree, as well as a number of kinases like the neck kinases, TLK1, TLK2, that are in categorized as other and not in a major subfamily. And then in the DEPMAP studies with this looking at essentiality of, of genes in the entire kinome, if you look at and focus uh, on, on rather on the genome and you focus on the kinome, there are seven understudy kinases that are essential across more than 700 cell lines and 33 illuminated kinases across these 700 cell lines that are essential for cell growth. And then just as a, a very brief, and I don't, you don't need to read this, if you look at the seven kinases of the understudy group that are essential across these cell lines, they fall into pathways in regulatory systems that are characteristic of many of the 33 kinases that are, have been illuminated. And just to go over this very quickly, PI4KA, is, is a major first catalytic reaction in the synthesis of PIP2 that's involved in the subcellular localization, regulation, movement of vesicles, as well as cell signaling. PKMYT1, also known as MIT1 or MYT1, collaborates with uh, WE1 to regulate CDK1 and mitosis. Real K1 and Real K2 are highly homologous proteins that are involved in the maturation of the 40S subunit for protein synthesis with the ribosome. Uh, TP53 regulating kinase phosphorylates P53 at serine 15. Uh, that's involved in control of its regulation of transcription, telomere uh, function and tRNA modification. CDK11, a cyclin-dependent kinase uh, understudied uh, is in a large complex with RNA polymerase II and is involved in regulation of transcription and pre-message splicing. And PRPF4B uh, is involved in pre-message slice uh, splicing, is in a CDK-like kinase or CLK-like kinase, and it has homology to the MAP kinases. And those seven essential kinases of the understudy group uh, fit into the pathways that are also seen with the illuminated kinases. Now I'm going to focus much of my talk today about uh, the use of MEK inhibitors, MEK12 in the ERK12 pathway, and that uh, when you inhibit MEK with an FDA-approved drug, uh, trametinib, uh, you inhibit ERK, and what you see is a, a, a frequently in most cell types a rapid degradation of CMEC. 
and you get a growth of rest. And CBIC is one of these transcription factors that frequently is in an inactive complex, has to be degraded, and it's then uh, uh, becomes a, a member of an activated transcription complex. And what I'm going to show you today is that uh, kinase inhibitors, not just trametinib, but I'm going to focus on trametinib, are involved in the regulation of kinase expression and activation. And the kinome actually turns out to be incredibly dynamic and plastic and adapts to targeted kinase inhibition with changes in expression and integration of kinome functions uh, to bypass this inhibition. And that this loss of CMYK is involved in gene expression editing and what I've called kinome plasticity. Now then, if you look at the whole transcriptome by RNA-seq, with treatment with trametinib, and I've used, and I'm showing here, uh, triple negative breast cancer cell lines after 24 hour treatment with either 30 or 100 nanomole or trametinib is what we usually use. And what you actually see is what I like to call a phenotypic state change, because you actually see a significant fraction of the transcriptome that changes either in being upregulated with increased transcription are downregulated with suppression of transcription. And here in triple negative breast cancer, the major subtypes are basal-like, which are epithelial-like, and clod and low, which are mesenchymal-like. And here you can look at three different cell lines that are basal-like, three different cell lines that are clod and low-like. And you can see that approximately somewhere between, you know, 10 to 20% of the, of the entire transcriptome is altered either by upregulation or by suppression. Some systems like some 159s are incredibly responsive where more than 30% of their tra functional transcriptome uh, is, is actually changed in its expression leading to this phenotypic state change. This also occurs in uh, mouse models. Uh, OST T11 uh, is, is this stands for um, orthotopic syngenetic transplant. These tumors were made from a P53 null uh, biopsy mouse and we had spontaneous, but we didn't do this. We, we obtained the mice and the tumors and the work and they, uh, it's in a syngenetic mouse with an immune system and we serially transplant these tumors. And you can see with trametinib treatment, we see this very significant change in the transcriptome. And this is a C3 tag mouse where T stand, where stands for T antigen, the tag. And it's expressed in the breast epithelial cells and they form uh, triple negative breast tumors. And you can see that 10% of the transcriptome is actually altered in response to trametinib. And then if you use GSEA enrichment analysis, you actually see, as you would predict, loss of MYC and you also see loss of KRAS signaling because the MAP kinase ER pathway is a major component of RAS signaling. Um, uh, you can also see that this function, not just in a transcriptional level at an RNA level, but you actually see changes. For example, here in the basal-like cell line, we see loss of CMYK and upregulation of FGFR2 and KIT. In the SUM 159s, which are clawed and low, we actually see different kinases, DDR1 and PGFR beta, for example, that are upregulated. So if you look at the heat map for the kinome in response to trametinib, what you see is that there's a dramatic difference between the mesenchymal cell type of triple negative breast cancer relative to the basal-like with these cell lines. Now then, if we look at this transcriptional plasticity and we look at twofold up or greater or twofold down, you can see this is in representative with some 159s, but I'm going to show you some, some more data in, in just a minute with other stimuli or perturbations. And what you can see is that in each fam, subfamily of the kinome, there is changes in the expression of different kinases and particularly in the tyrosine kinases, but also in these groups of kinases such as the neck family uh, that don't fit into one of the characterized uh, subfamilies like CAM kinase or AGC. 
And here I just have a brief description of what these different subtypes are and what it means to be other. So uh, other would be, for example, in the neck family. So you can see that it's not just tyrosine kinases. It's not just PKA or PKC or PKG or CAM kinases. It's across every subfamily of the kinome and even the atypical kinases that we see changes in the transcriptional uh, network of kinase expression. And this causes what I've results in what I've referred to as this phenotypic state change. Ellen, this phenotypic state change and this alteration in the, in the expression of the kinome is selective for different perturbations. So here's trametinib that I just showed you. Here's an AKT inhibitor, MK2206. And you can see that there are common, these are some of the cell cycle regulatory proteins that we see with AKT inhibition. But all three of these stimuli, these treatments, these perturbations result in growth arrest. But you can see that the different subfamilies are different in terms of their, there's an overlap, but a selectivity for each perturbation. So the cell is able to sense the inhibition of a specific pathway and be able to respond in an attempt to overcome and bypass this perturbation. And we don't need to go through all of this, but if you do these eight different treatments, again, AKT inhibition, trametinib, bortezomib, a BCL2XL inhibitor, palbociclib, a CDK4-6, a histone acyl transferase, an HDAC inhibitor, uh, cobalt chloride as a oxidative stress. Each, the, the cell senses this, and this transcriptomic change of the kinome and expression of specific kinases is unique for each different perturbation that we, we uh, use to treat the cells. So the cell and the kinome, this shows the plasticity that the kinome has. And I'll just use an example here real quickly. In Tinnistat, uh, is an HDAC inhibitor, so you inc which is uh, histone deacetylase. So you're removing uh, ac acetylation groups on lysines of histones, for example, as well as other proteins. And um, I'm sorry, let's see, let me uh, make sure I get this right. This is an HDAC inhibitor, so you actually increase the acetylation of histones and you increase gene expression. So we see this dramatic increase in the expression of kinases within the kinome. The, uh, the histone acetyl transferase inhibitor inhibits acetylation of histones. And what we see is actually a dramatic inhibition of the expression of specific kinases. So you can see the difference if, if you alter, increase acetylation of histones and other pro regulatory proteins or decrease the acetylation of proteins. You see the opposite effect in terms of the expression of specific kinases. And then this is clinically relevant, and we've shown this in a window of opportunity trial where there's actually no benefit for the patient. But these are women that had triple negative breast cancer with no previous treatment like chemotherapy, and we're gonna have surgery to resect the tumor. And they volunteered to give a core needle biopsy, uh, and then they went on trametinib for seven days and had their tumor removed. And we would analyze by both RNA-seq and what Martin talked about, NIBMS, uh, the core needle biopsy relative to the tumor after seven days trametinib treatment. Now then, if we look at this, here's six patients. One's a clodin low, five are basal-like. And that about 80% of triple negative is basal-like and a much smaller number is clodin low. And what you can see is we see the same kind when we look at whole transcriptome changes, an upregulation of a subset of genes and a downregulation of a subset of genes. And just as you would predict, we would expect to see a variation in this among the different patient tumors based on their genomic background. And then if we actually look at the kinome trees by RNA-seq from this in the patient tumors, and here we're looking at the kinome transcriptional changes resulting from seven-day trametinib treatment. And we're looking at the tumor relative to the ratio after treatment relative to pretreatment. And you can see that each one of the patients, uh, I'm showing here five patients, 
you can see that each one of them has a, a regulation of inhibition of specific kinases throughout the kinome tree, as well as an upregulation, which is shown in red of specific kinases. Here's a patient, for example, uh, that we had a dramatic increase in a number of different receptor tyrosine kinases without a significant inhibition of a number of kinases in the seven-day treatment. Whereas here we can see in the tyrosine kinases, we see both suppression as well as induction of specific kinases. If we just take this data and we put it into a kinome tree cumulatively for these five patients and look at illuminated kinases versus understudy kinases, and you remember that the understudy kinases are about 28% to 30% of the entire kinome, we see the representation in all the subfamilies of the kinome of these understudied kinases uh, relative to what we see with illuminated kinases. The one branch that has the fewest understudy kinases is the tyrosine kinases because they've been studied so much. And you see the upregulation or downregulation across these patient tumors. And there's only three understudy kinases and we see one of those, or actually there's two and one's blocked in the tyrosine kinase family. But in all the other subfamilies, we see regulation of the understudied kinases similarly to what we see with the illuminated kinases. And then we don't have to read this. We can just look at the color codes. So these are the subfamilies of the kinases from the patient tumors. And what we're looking at is um, the red are understudy kinases and in the black are just are, are, uh, illuminated kinases. And we can look at the ratios of the total kinases relative to the illuminate, the understudy kinases relative to the total number of kinases. And you can see there's a small number of tyrosine kinases that are understudied that were regulated, LMTK3 and LTK, in the patients in this window trial. But if you look at the serine threonine kinases, the understudy kinases are represented fractionally to the same degree that they are in terms of their expression uh, in the kinome tree. So the understudy kinases are regulated similarly to the illuminated kinases that just haven't researched the detailed uh, investigation that uh, the illuminated kinases have seen. And you can see this in the patients uh, with the upregulation of protein. So we're measuring RNA by RNA-seq, but we can also do Western blots. And sometimes we have enough patient tumor to actually do MIBMS and see the changes in the expression of, of specific kinases that we saw with RNA-seq. It's interesting, you can see like the upregulation of kit and DDR1 uh, in patients one and two. Patient four is interesting because it's already upregulated, these kinase, tyrosine kinases in the absence of treatment. So you can see the variation in the tumor. This is the Claudin low patient. We see DDR1, FGFR2, IGFR1 upregulated. And then I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit, and I'm gonna go into the epigenetics of the basis for this kinome plasticity and the, and the um, transcriptional changes that we see. Um, and one of the things that I will focus on is looking at enhancer and promoter regions of the kinase genes. And just briefly, we do this, uh, one of the methods we use is chromatin IP or chromatin immunoprecipitation. And just briefly for the people that aren't familiar with this, you actually do a cell treatment. So we would do minus and plus trametinib treatment and we formaldehyde cross-link the cells or the tissues. We can actually do this in tumors. And formaldehyde cross-link the chromatin to the DNA when we do treat the cells with formaldehyde. We then shear the DNA into very reproducible fragments. And in our case, we use 300 base pair fragments where we have the shearing um, uh, methods uh, very standardized. We then use and we then immunoprecipitate with a chromatin and IP antibody. So this has to be a very clean antibody, for example, to a BET bromodomain protein BRD4, to acetylated uh, lysine of histone H3 
glycine 27, a, a compatible antibody to MED1 in the MED regu transcriptional regulatory complex, or for example, with H3K4 trimethylation antibody. We then sequence the DNA, and then we informatically stitch the peaks together. And so here you can see minus with BRD4, here's resting DMSO treated cells, and then cells treated with trametinib. And you can see the increase in these peaks, and this correlates to the DDR1 receptor enhancer, as well as we can see peaks at the promoter region. And then when you do this with trametinib treatment, it's amazing that the, the rapidity of the transcriptional response that we actually see. I keep, my mouse is too jumpy here. And what you can see is um, in, within four hours, we actually have a reorganization of the chromatin. And this is the DDR1 enhancer. And you can see that within four hours, and it's fairly stable at 24, and, it, and it's actually, this is about 90% of what the uh, increase in the enhancer peaks. Um, for in this case, this is BRD4, but you see the same thing, for example, with H3K27 acetylation or MED1. And you can see that this correlates with a loss of CMYK and an upregulation of a specific protein. Here's DDR1, and you can see that it's actually increasing even at a protein level within four hours where we see this activation of the enhancer of DDR1. And then this trametinib induced uh, BRD4 uh, accumulation at enhancers or H3K27 in this case uh, is seen, for example, at the enhancer and promoter of Mark one which is an understudy kinase. It's a member of the CAM kinase family. And these, you can see there's a number of understudy kinases here. And so we've actually done uh, chip IP in the laboratory and are characterizing uh, the understudy kinases and their regulation. And it's, it's basically similar to what we see with the illuminated kinases. And we see this rapid enhancement uh, of uh, enhancers uh, in multiple different cell types and tumors. And here we're just looking at a quantitation of enhancer formation across the genome. This is genome-wide chip analysis with BRD4. We would see exactly the same thing, for example, with um, histone H3K27 acetylation. And so at baseline in untreated cells, you actually see about 1,400 enhancers. And there's 60 super enhancers, which are large enhancers that are thought to be, for example, driving different proto-oncogenes. And when you treat with trametinib, you can see that there's a significant increase to maybe 2,700 enhancers with a large group of super enhancers that are encoded by these receptor tyrosine kinases and other genes, including understudy kinases that uh, uh, become activated and increase in their protein expression. And this is a quantitation of the number of super enhancers. Now then JQ1 is an inhibitor of BRD4. And so this is, we inhibit the association of BRD4 with these enhancers, and we disrupt the ability of the cell to form these enhancers and increase promoter uh, expression of BRD4. And you actually suppress expression of the particular gene. And you can see here that we block the formation of super enhancers with BRD4 alone. And we also block the ability of trametinib to, when you inhibit the MECRT pathway and decrease MYC expression, that it also blocks the formation of these enhancers in the presence of trametinib. And then we can actually show this. This is that time course that I showed previously. And we've actually used CRISPR to delete, for example, the enhancer region. So here we deleted a 7 KB, 17 KB region of the DDR1 enhancer. And we can show that it's this formation and this accumulation of these uh, enhancer enriching proteins that are actually driving the expression of DDR1. And so you can see that it's dramatically inhibited. We still have uh, a small level of expression where we have a 
promoter enhancement here. And this correlates with loss of CMEG. And so we know that this enhancer, this is the enhancer region, for example, for DDR1, and it's required for the trametinib induction of the protein. Now then, excuse me, I'm sorry, this keeps happening to me. We can also show that this trametinib induced uh, enhancer formation and, and in super enhancer formation occurs with understudy kinases. And I just give you an example here of Mark 1, where we see uh, with trametinib treatment for 24 hours is enhancement and recruitment of, of uh, H3K27 acetylation to the, Jesus, Gary, I'm doing bad here. Okay, where am I? Okay, here, I skipped a slide. Okay, so we can actually, this occurs with the understudy kinases as well as uh, in, uh, illuminated kinases. So this is a characteristic of the kinome in response to different perturbations. Is, and its function is to basically bypass, attempt to bypass this inhibition and overcome this adaptive resistance. Now then, here is, I showed you this before, the enhancer formation and the uh, CRISPR cutting removal of the enhancer protein. And that this correlates this enhancement of, of uh, recruitment of, of BRD4, uh, H3K27 acetylation, uh, MED1, it correlates with transcription. And you can block that the formation of these enhancers with JQ1 and you block the transcriptional response. So this is a functional response. Um, and we can show that this occurs at the protein level. And then if you knock down BRD4, you get the same response as if you use uh, GSK. This is a different, uh, not trametinib, but a, a, um, this is trametinib just in the old days when we called it GSK inhibitor. And you get the same response when you knock down BRD4 as if you use a, a BRD4 inhibitor. And we can show that this occurs in uh, tumors in mice where we have someone 5-9 xenografts. Here's the control tumor, tumor with IBET151, which is uh, an inhibitor, another GSK, uh, um, BRD4 inhibitor other than JQ1. And we can show that uh, trametinib alone has a growth inhibitory response, but we're able to sustain the inhibition of the growth with IBET151 that we would normally see with trametinib. Uh, stimulate. Uh, here's a trametinib alone, and we see the synergistic effect with trametinib plus IBET151. And we can show that this correlates with transcription of uh, a loss of transcription with IBET151 that's induced by trametinib. And we can do this in these orthotopic syngenetic transplants. And you can see that the combination of trametinib and IBET151, the BRD4 inhibitor, uh, blocks, uh, enhances the um, inhibition of tumor growth and prevents the uh, escape uh, with trametinib that you see with trametinib alone. And then if we do single cell sequencing, we can show that in these tumors, we can actually see that here's DDR1 with trametinib. We see uh, several different cells. We actually see the increased expression. Um, Here's uh, with trametinib, and we blocked this with trametinib plus JQ1. Here again, ROS1, another tyrosine kinase. We basically see a complete loss of expression. Here's a gene where we have some baseline expression at low levels with trametinib. That's dramatically increased, and we're able to return these to more near basal level with inhibition of its expression. And then, so basically, what we believe is that drug-induced enhancers, and this is a fairly common response, and I'm almost done here, um, is an untapped, Jesus, Gary, an un untapped frontier of epigenetic targets to block and reverse adaptive bypass resistance. And we've used a number of inhibitors besides BRD4 inhibitors, uh, CBP, P300 inhibitors that are part of this enhancer complex, CDK9 inhibitors, 
that Martin talked about. And each one of these are able to block this plasticity and adaptive transcriptional response. And just to end quickly here, we can show gene expression changes induced by trametinib. Uh, it correlates with uh, acetylation and that uh, in cells where we have gained acetylation, we have increased transcription and loss of acetylation, we have um, loss of transcription. And we've used this in a cell system that goes back to Barton's work called uh, some 229 PE cells. And they actually maintain a mesenchymal phenotype and, a, and an epithelial phenotype. And we've actually published a paper where we did a screen and an RNAi screen and showed that we could convert the EPCAM negative cells to an EPCAM positive cell by uh, an RNA that targeted regulatory subunit of SWE SNF, saying that this is a, a, a chromatin epigenetic regulation between these two cell populations. And if we use FAIR, and we've switched to uh, ATAC now, but to measure open chromatin states and have it correlated with H3K27 acetylation, this epithelial population has a different open chromatin state relative to this epithelial population here. And so you have this heterogeneity within the tumor with different open chromatin states that causes a differential response to drug. Now then, what, this is the last slide. What I've described is a MEK1-2 inhibition. And we've also done this with HER2 inhibitors in a window trial in patients similar to what I described with MEK1-2. Now then, work that by other investigators with making irreversible inhibitors to KRAS-G12C uh, which is a relatively rare mutant, primarily found in colon and, and lung, but they've made irreversible covalent inhibitors that target the sulfhydryl group of the cysteine. And what they see is the same adaptive plasticity that I just described to you for MEK inhibitors and that also occurs in HER2 inhibitors. And what they showed was that they were able to block this adaptive response using a SHIP2 phosphotyrosine phosphatase inhibitor that was able to suppress receptor tyrosine kinase activation, uh, not just of wild type KRAS, but also of N and HRAS, where they've inhibited the mutant KRAS GC. And then, so what we did was use inhibitors of, of uh, enhancers. <laughs> but what I think this font shows is that with different tyrosine kinase inhibitors, different inhibitors of important growth regulatory pathways like the BEPMAP kinase pathway, that there's dramatic adaptive reorganization of the kinome. And what's predicted is that we will have to have mechanistically informed combinations of a targeted kinase or RAS inhibitor with an adaptive resistance inhibitor, such as the SHIP2 phosphotyrosine phosphatase inhibitor or enhancer uh, inhibitors of the enhancer remodeling that I've described in today's talk. So I'm going to stop there and we'll open it to questions and, and I want to acknowledge the people that have helped with this work. So thank you. Thank you both uh, for your wonderful talks. Um, we would encourage um, the audience to uh, enter in questions that they may have to the Q&A box on the bottom. I don't see. Yes, I'm not seeing any a questions. Chat <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, I will uh, leave it open for a moment, a little bit longer. Um, I would also, uh, as we're waiting for people to enter in questions or uh, comments, um, also just uh, reiterate that we're continuing this series with highlighting GPCRs that will be happening on April 6th. 
and um, the uh, registration can be found on Eventbrite as well as um, on our uh, druggablegenome.org site, um, that net site, excuse me. Um, once again, uh, if you have any questions. They could email me if there's a specific question and I'm more than willing to share slides. So. Oh, there is one question that popped up. Gary, you raised the possibility of RAS inhibition. Now there are RAS inhibitors that have been tested in vitro. Yeah, there's actually the, the RAS G, G12C, the KRAS G12C is actually in clinical trials in people. There are two different groups that have inhibitors that are actually in phase one trials. And there are two papers that have been published, um, one in clinical cancer research, I believe, and one in nature, where they actually characterize the kinome plasticity that occurs with targeting uh, the KRAS G12C uh, activated RAS. And they show that the, a similar kinome plasticity that I described for MEK inhibitor um, and that they were able to uh, overcome this with this phosphatase, this uh, specific phosphatase inhibitor that's required for activation of RAS in response to tyrosine kinase. So that's actually in clinical trials with this one RAS inhibitor specific for the cysteine in the G12C mutate mutant form. I think that addresses Brian's second question had been, have these been tested in your system? Uh, we tested the kinase and the phosphatase inhibitor with MEK inhibition, and we didn't see it, um, that this blocked the kinone plasticity to MEK inhibitor, but I think we're going to revisit this, especially now in combination with HER2 and what we see in HER2 positive breast cancer and what we see and with MEK inhibition. So if we go downstream of RAS, do we not see this phosphatase working and this phosphatase inhibitor working as well? Can I maybe ask a question? Go for sure. It. Great. <laughs> Gary, great talk, really fantastic. Um, I so, might, I'm um, sorry my mouse was so jumpy. I <laughs> it's okay, uh, it's just a sign of the times. Um, <laughs> so uh, you showed those patients that dynamically rewired a kinome in response to drug treatment. I think it was five patients, breast cancer mm. patients. Yeah. And they looked quite different on the level of the kinome. Yeah. Was there any overlap at all? Yeah, there's a significant overlap, I have those those figures. I mean, there, there's an overlap of 10 to 20% or something like that of the kinases. And there's an overlap with the TMBC cell lines that we use. Um, some of this is published. Um, and there was a cancer discovery paper that where we published the window trial. And that data is in there. I just, I went over as it is in time. I just didn't have time to show it. But there is some overlap with, not with all of them, but you know, I, I think we, it's what you see in patients, you know, this is real patient. This is a human that was given this drug orally and we received their tumors and a pre-treatment biopsy and treatment, so. But um, that's encouraging, I guess. But we've gone, so, so where we've gone now, these window trials take a long time because you have to get volunteers to do it. Uh, where we're trying to go now is organoids. Um, and we're working with the clinical oncology and surgery people to, one, to be able to make, we have a really good person who runs a core to make organoids. And um, also uh, just tumor biopsies that we can use and then fresh tumor where we can characterize the tumors. Um, and we're trying to do this at a mass spec level as well as at a, transcription level. Okay, thank you. On that note, uh, I don't see any more additional questions. Um, and uh, as Gary said, and I'm sure Martin is open to, to having emails if you have further questions or concerns. 
Um, and I thank you once again for your participation. And I thank you all to the audience for your um, uh, joining us. And I hope to see you all in one week from today. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>